little stars are beginning to blink and peep. But the young lie long and dream in their bed of the matching of ribbons for bosom and head. In the anatomy of influence, one of the things you talk about most poignantly is the importance you find in falling in love with literature. And you speak about that again and again and again. And I think well, falling in love with a poem or falling in love with a Shakespearean play or character is not greatly different from a young man or a young woman, or in these days, a young man and a young man falling in love with one another. It's, a, it's essentially the same human mode. Of course, sometimes you fall out of love with a person, and indeed you fall out of love with particular poems and poets. But without that initial um, falling in love, I don't think the work of memory begins. I don't think possession in any sense of possession, whether by memory or any other mode, can take place. Why is it so important, as you say, to possess a poem by memory? Well, what is gain? cannot overestimate the importance of memory in the intellectual, or indeed, if we can still use the term, the spiritual life. Um, without memory, you can't think. Just as without memory, you can't write a poem. You can't read a poem. You can't try to bring two poems together. You can hardly do anything at all. And you have to train the memory. And the only way to train it is doing it by yourself. Never shall a young man thrown into despair by those great honey-colored ramparts at your ear love you for yourself alone and not your yellow hair. But I can get some hair dye and set such color there, brown or black or carrot, that young men in despair may love me for myself alone and not my yellow hair. To just continue for a moment with, with Whitman, when did you actually start reading his poetry? Oh, I must have been about a little later than some of the other poets. Must have been 12 or 13 or so. I certainly did not know what to make of it at the beginning. But I remember one day I stumbled upon the sleepers and that was it. That gave the immortal wound that extraordinary vision of a drowned heroic swimmer. What do you mean when you say immortal wound? Well, if a poem pierces you enough in heart and in intellect so that you never really get over it, it, it qualifies as an immortal wound. Shakespeare, or rather his Hamlet, speaks of wonder wounded Hearers, H-E-A-R-E-R-S, any poet, we don't ask that they all be Shakespeare, that they all be Hamlet, but any poet who wounds you by wonder has given you probably an immortal wound, provided there's not something wrong with you, of course. Perhaps in some sense, without knowing it, at least too explicitly, you keep falling in love with the with books or people because you fear that the deep human energy in you is beginning to ebb. Perhaps that's why I go on teaching. I'm not altogether sure. Would you, uh, would you agree with Cicero that to philosophize is to learn how to die? In some way we, we, we read in order to prepare ourselves. The great I don't books. like that, no. My, my, my heart is not with Cicero, it's with Sir John Falstaff. Give me life. <laughs> the meaning of the brook of the Hebraic blessing, as I translate it, is more life. And if possible, more life into a time without any boundaries whatsoever. Obviously, that's impossible. But the aspiration is there, and the aspiration is healing and quite wonderful. I heard an old religious man but yesternight declare that he had found a text to prove that only God, my dear, could love you for yourself alone and not your yellow hair. Thank you very much. Thank you.